everyone and welcome to another Scots Way podcast and today we're talking to uh, Ronnie Brown. Ronnie, thanks for doing this. Not at all, it's not a great, well I hope it's going to be a great pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, I'm sure it will be. Um, now some people might say, Ronnie Brown, not sure I can place the name. Who he, uh, Who he. We're here to talk about your autobiography and it's called, well it's titled That Guy for the Corries. It's not, it's entitled Ronnie Brown. That guy for the corner. Absolutely. And Ronnie Brown first, and then that guy for well, the corner. for me, I can see why the public might think it's the Corries first. Fair enough. I'll admit the Corries whole thing brought Ronnie Brown's name to the fore. But fine, there's a wee bit more to Ronnie Brown than the same. It's your life story. Exactly. It's not the story of the Corries, it's your it's life story. Exactly. From your exactly. childhood days in Edinburgh yeah. to the present day. The present day. Um, so, first of all, why did you decide to, to write the book? I was persuaded to. Aye. Just like you've said, people kept saying, oh, you must write the book. And I'm saying, who's interested? You know? Aye. Because I've never seen me as anything other than a working singer, mm-hmm. a, a working man, a working portrait painter, whatever. So, okay, you know you've got people who are interested, but to buy a book about it. Aye. Uh, I, I, so I was finally persuaded to do it. I know it's a strange thing, uh, Alistair. Can I just interject? Yeah, sure. 1990, when I did the Grand Slam painting, mm-hmm. the representative from the Royal Bank who sponsored uh, Scottish rugby, uh, Alwyn James, nice, nice Roger Whitaker type guy, nice. gentle Welshman, he was the representative and the liaison between uh, the bank and the, the rugby. And the day after, the, the very morning after we won the Grand Slam in 1990, he was mm-hmm. on the phone, we want another painting running. I said, well, fair enough. By that time, I'd sort of worked out. At that time, and this is, what, 25 years ago? Yeah, he said right. to me, because he was in the literary business, he says, you know, you've got to write the book. And he says, if you like, I'll, I'll help you ghostwrite it. And I said, listen, I'm only 53 years old. I'm a slip of a boy. Yeah. When you're a slip of a boy, you do not write your autobiography. I couldn't agree with that. So 25 years on, I finally persuaded. And who was at the launch two nights ago? Alwyn James. Oh, and I apologise for not getting him in the, the ghostwriting this time because I'm not letting anybody share my royalties. <laughs> 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 we should say as well as I mean you are a, a, a very good painter and you've been you know been doing portraits and and you did yeah. as you say a portrait of the Scottish rugby team for to celebrate the in eighty four and in nineteen ninety yeah. yeah well uh, it wasn't it was a centerpiece right and each each of the, the things but because they wanted the centerpiece done up from black and white photographs for me to enlarge it and add colour. That's fine, but as I said to them in 84 and in 90, I'm a portrait painter. Why not surround it with portraits of the whole squad? And that's that's what happened with the two of them. So you had to be persuaded to write the book. Now you've done it, are you glad you did? Did you enjoy the whole thing? Well, I'm relieved because it took me nearly a year. Aye. And I'm not saying every hour of every day, but I mean, it's never out your your mind. And by the time you do a, 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 a tract and send it up to, to Bob Davidson at uh, Sandstone, and he goes, well, we'll do this, we'll do that. And then you start again the next track. And it takes a long, long time. Yeah, aye, it's a long process. But I'm pleased that's over. But it's not over because we're now trying to go out and, and, and get people to buy it. Aye, it's a long process. You, you see, the, the, I've been criticised all my life for the singing, the painting, etc. I kind of get money out of it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's your job. So everybody works for, 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 for a living. And people say to you, we hear it all the time, money's not important, money's... Money's no important if you've got... If you have, aye. When you haven't got money... It's very important. It's very important. Well, that goes back to your own childhood, which you write about in the book. It's, it, some of the most memorable parts are your memories of growing up in Edinburgh post-war. 1940s, would that be about... Well, I was born in 37, so... Aye, just aye. Just so talk a bit about those times of your upbringing. Uh, like what? So, talk about other than what I've written in the book. Well, no, it's in the book, <laughs> absolutely. It's all in the book, but... Uh, just what it was like at that time, your memories of growing up in Edinburgh at that, at that well, time. As I say, everyone, you're a boy, right? Right. and we uh, played down at the Meadows, which we, which we called the Meadies, mm-hmm. which then, after the war, became allotments because we were all encouraged. So all of that kind of thing. And this is another thing, when I was asked to write the book, that's what came into mind. That's all I can write about, because yeah. that's all I know about, yeah. is my own life. Who's interested in somebody's allotment? Who's interested that we had three budgies we buried in the allotment? I and think they encouraged the onions to come up better, <laughs> you know. But then you start, you start to think maybe that is of interest. I think know? it is of interest because there are other people 
Um, my dad's also about the same age, and you know his reminiscence of his childhood in, in Glasgow were quite similar to yours. And yeah, so I yeah. think people think, oh, it wasn't just me that was uh, doing those things or having those things. Exactly. So people a, are interested. Yeah, well, I, but I think so. And if they're not, I can't help it. That's that's <laughs> what an autobiography is. Yes. Your life and yeah. what you've done and the memories that you have. And I've been as honest as I can about them. And you, you you say that you'd never had uh, any kind of musical training, and and uh, although you went to art college, didn't you? Yes. Um, so, how did you end up singing? Just did you just? Well, when I say I had no musical, well, I had no mu- musical training, but I always knew I had a voice. Yeah. Now let's go way way back to okay. when I was three or four years old. Aye. I used to draw matchstick men. Have you ever seen matchstick men? A yeah. Really round head. And Aye. Just, and my father saw that at that time, he said you get an awful lot of life in it. And I'd have, I just did them. And he encouraged me to, to start uh, um, copying things, etc., yeah. etc. Out of the copying, he enrolled me as the youngest member of the Edinburgh Sketching Club when I was 11. Wow. And I started to do things. And there's a drawing there I did of the Black Watch Memorial yeah. at age 11, sitting on a wee camp stool in the middle of uh, Edinburgh, and two reporters come down. This is strange, which it was yeah. for most people. But I, I did it. And, and, and the evidence is there. And out of that... And I've written a story there, well, I've written in the story, that I was about the same time I was a milk boy, Mm -hmm. right? And a cart ran over my toe, and it got black, and the the nail was going to come off. And with my mother being a medium, she said, we must have a spiritualist healing. So I went to a spiritualist healer. Now, you can believe it or you can believe it not, Uh that they are such things. And as she's kneading my toe, and, and... and without even looking up, she says, you know, this boy's not going to make his name from a drawing or painting. It's from music. Yeah, and carry wow. on. Because before that uh, Black Watch drawing, there was a, a thing called the Satchel Club, which I haven't mentioned in the book, uh-huh. which was in the Daily Express every Saturday morning in the children's section. Right. So I won a, a portrait competition there, a oh, self-portrait fantastic. in that. And that was on uh, uh, in the papers. Mm-hmm. And then when I went to the, the Army Cadets, I was about 13, 14, I drew a recruitment poster which went round all the cinemas, the foyers in Edinburgh, and that got in the papers. Yeah. So that's why she said, at that time, my, my, my drawing, my painting career was starting to blossom. Sure. And nobody ever thought about singing. Aye. Although, Hug I used to sing, uh, same as we all did. Uh-huh. And these days, uh, everybody's door was open, right? Not so uh, in this day and age. But, and it's the only time you had drink in the house. Yeah. And I've, I've told the story about my father's trumpeter, what are you sounding now? Bang. We never ever found out what he was sounding now because he was pissed. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's another thing that, I mean, again, people maybe don't realise, but drink wasn't readily available in the house. It was a no. very special occasion, partly because it was so damn expensive. For people uh, 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 certainly. And it just was not that, but mm-hmm. you didn't. Only at Hogmanay. But nowadays everybody has drink. Fair enough, I'm not hanging against drink. Uh-huh. And by the look of you, you've nothing to drink. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. remember when I said we can edit stuff out. <laughs> <laughs> but nah, but talking about, was it not the Gorbals? When they knocked the Gorbals down, everybody was concerned because the Gorbals was a community where people went from door to door to door to door. And does that happen now? It doesn't. No. I'm not saying it should. But that's, that's how I was brought up. Aye. You asked the original question, and I can only recount these memories. Aye, absolutely. But I think the, the the thing that gets me in the book is that by telling these stories, there'll be lots of people there who would want to read them because it's very reminiscent of their own well, upbringing. It has to be, because I had neighbours. Aye, aye well, exactly. <laughs> we all live in the same way. Aye. But being encouraged to draw uh, from, from such a young age, I think that, is, that isn't a common thing. I think a lot of people, you know... Maybe their fathers would say, oh, what are you doing that for? Oh, it's a waste of as I've described, my father was a frustrated artist. Yeah. Because in that, the picture that uh, appeared in the paper after I did the drawing of the, the, the Black Watch wasn't mm-hmm. the Black Watch. It was that the, uh, the, the reporters came and they got a, a, my, my niece, Norma, to come and sit. And I was purportedly drawing her portrait. And behind me, they pinned up my pencil copy of my father's watercolour copy of the Laughing Cavalier by Franz Hals. Mm-hmm. And it's only by me walking past it every day I realised that this he had done this. Mm-hmm. Talented guy. Yeah. But in his day, they had no grants, they had no talk about the working boys going to art college and things. Aye. And really, why I c- continued in it, as I've described in the book, is I thought, well, it might make a difference to him if I end up at art college. 
which it did, he was so proud. Yeah. And yet, that same man who says he's proud of me, on my wedding day, my wedding day, he says, oh, you're far too young. You should be out there sowing your wild oats. <laughs> a dirty old bugger, eh? When you think of it, on my wedding day. Man, you're, yeah, yeah, it's a bit late for that advice <laughs> now. <laughs> <It's> just, <yeah. laughs> well, uh, part of that, you know, your, your marriage to Pat's one of the central things in the book, and course, it's yeah. the absolute drama. So you should maybe talk about but that we're sitting in this lovely house of yours oh, and of hers, <laughs> of hers as well um, well, and she's, she's beside you through the whole book yeah well I, I, it described my six year old uh, I first fell in love with Maureen McCann Aye. who looked at the snotty wee kids and said, who's that <laughs> I, I'd lo- I, I did meet her later in life and if now one of the, the signings or, or one of the, 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 the things if she comes up and says hello I'd love it yeah. I'd love it but uh, all of that, and same as everybody else, I've described the, the, the winky game and metal when I was seven and, and all that. Everybody does that. All youngsters, and you all have fatuations when you're, you're in your early teens. And then when Pat came along, that was it. Yeah. And we had a five-year courtship. Five-year courtship. When I was going to art college, Pat had started working and thought students were the pits because we were all... Like airy fairy, you know, the, <laughs> the world owes us a living, right? and she's working hard at accountancy. And then at the end of that time, frustration partly, but I was going to start to work. I was still to do uh, uh, um, Murray House teachers training mm-hmm. when we got married, and and we had a five year courtship. Every morning in life, breakfast, my mother's there, my father's there, and ex- they were expecting me every morning to say, "Oh, we're going to have to get married." We did not. Yeah. It was a year and a half, two years before we had Gavin of first boy, because there was respect as well as love and all this. Yeah. And I'm getting emotional. Yeah. And uh, that respect shines through in the book, absolutely. Well, hopefully, because it was there. Yeah. Look, Alistair, see that? Yeah. I've got a wedding ring on there. That buckle on the ring is a Victorian idea. At the end of your first year of marriage, you seal that marriage by you giving your wife an eternity ring mm-hmm. and your wife giving you a keeper. Yeah. And that seals your, your wedding. And that's your keeper. Now, Pat knew what she was doing because over the 50-odd years that we were together, my finger has grown round that thing and I can't get it off. <laughs> At least yours means something. Mine doesn't come off. It doesn't mean <laughs> thing. <laughs> so, Pat's been dead three years now. And uh-huh. since a month after it, people start saying to me, are you going to get somebody else? Yeah. What a horrible expression. Yeah, it is to somebody who's been married for all these years, the, the, the person you know, you're going to get somebody. What a terrible word. So now, I used to get annoyed, I don't know, I just say, there, there isn't room on that other finger for another woman. <laughs> Fantastic, yes. Yeah. Not interesting. Um, Apart from the fact I'm 77 years old, <laughs> who's interested in a 77 year old man? Maybe a 77 year old woman. A 77 year old woman, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the the when the Corries itself they started um, as a trio, which Corey, I didn't realise. Corrie trio and Paddy Bell. Paddy Bell, Bell. Force of Force of yeah. And uh, so how did it come that you ended up just you and yourself and Roy? Well, Roy and I met at art college. Yeah. And when we were at art college. And we weren't buddies because a he was at Gordonston School. Ooh, now you come from quite different backgrounds, oh, right? Entirely, but fine. We got on. We just said hello, passing. Because mm-hmm. in the first year there were two sections. He was in one section and I was in the other. But by <coughs> the end of the fourth year, I discovered he had a skiffle group, mm-hmm. and Lonnie Donegan was his god. Aye. Well, anyway, but I wasn't interested in music then. I'd started maybe to, but it was uh, Ravel's Bolero was the first thing I ever uh, bought Aye. A, 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 an LP. And uh, for some strange reason, I picked up a couple of songs, My, my Bonnie Laddie's Lying on the Ground, and I think it was McPherson's Rant, off a Robin Hall, Jimmy McGregor EP. Right. Why, I don't know. I just fancied it. It just came out of the blue. So I knew these two songs. And then I used to... I worked in Paddy's Bar, when Paddy's Bar was in uh, Rose Street. Right. Very, very popular place. And I worked in the bar uh, when I was a student. And there was a, a barman called Joe. Mm-hmm. And every night when we're cleaning up the dishes, but he'd start singing, and I would just join in, because I'd done all the Abbey Marias and things, you know, at Hug Marie, sure. I was a boy, and the scout uh, shows and everything else. And old Macrossan, uh, she used to say, oh, we'll have to have you singing to the audience, but which never ever happened. So that's, there was all that going on. So one night, Roy and I got closer, because we both went to Murray House Teachers Training College together. Mm-hmm. 
So he used to play on the wing for um, Edinburgh Wanderers, and I played on the wing for Borough Muir. So now and again, we'd be in opposition. In the uh, games, right. Right? Uh. And here's a point. A lot of people say, Roy didn't seem to have much of a sense of humour. Okay. I said, listen, anybody who admits to playing for Edinburgh Wanderers has to have <laughs> a sense of humour. <laughs> However, what happened then was we went to Murray House Teachers Training College and we started to, to play in the midweek game together. Mm -hmm. So at the weekends we might be opposing and then, and out of that we started to visit each other's house. Mm -hmm. And one night Roy got the guitar out and started singing and I started to harmonise. And Roy's wife, Vi, was sitting beside Pat just in the room. They heard this and Vi pipes up, oh, there could be another Holland McGregor. And so it's transpired. And that's, but that's how it started, me singing with Roy. However, when Roy joined the trio, the yeah. trio and Paddy Bell, it wasn't known as a trio and Paddy Bell, and it didn't have a name. Right. So I was friendly with other people, and we went along to support them one night, and they were very, very good. And all of a sudden, one of the guys, Ron Cruikshank, had to drop out with glandular fever the night before their first engagement at the Trice Coffee House in the Edinburgh Festival. Right. They were engaged for three weeks. So they were in a panic, because everything was uh, for three voices. And Roy said, well, Ronnie knows a couple of songs. And that's how it happened. I got in and started singing. And I sang for money then. Yeah. Because I was on £11 a week. In fact, I don't know if I was even started teaching then. I must have been 62. Yeah, it was. £11 a week as a teacher. Mm. A lot of your youngsters listen to this. They, I love you're joking. Can I get £11 an hour? Though? Yeah. So £11 a week as a teacher. What we were offered for a night's work was a fiver. Five uh -huh. pounds. We used a pound for the taxi and we got a pound each. Right. So at the end of a week, seven weeks, I was almost doubling my wages. Uh -huh. So out of that, three weeks, that was it. And I thought, that's it. Fine, that's it. I've made some money. Uh -huh. Sure. But the, the, we, we became so popular from that and it took a wee while before it percolated until 1963 with the, the, the Hoot Nanny shows uh -huh. with W. Gordon Smith. Uh -huh. And from there, then I had to give up teaching because it was that or... or Music. And you kind of decided teaching wasn't for you anyway. Well, you? I, would have, I would have had to get out of it. I mean, it wasn't for me. Mm. I mean, I, I won't go into it. It's just that I, I wasn't a, a teacher. Yeah. I, I would have had to do something else. Aye. I went looking for a job in whaling. Aye. And Salvesons was still going just before they stopped. Uh -huh. And Because it was a two year thing, but evidently you made a lot of money. I'd have been away for two years earning money, bringing it back. But then I discovered that Salvesons was closing down mm -hmm. and an old guy says it's maybe just as well you didn't go son because uh, a lot of guys go for two years and they get into gambling and they come back with nothing Aye, uh, similar to the yeah. oil rigs as well exactly exactly so I didn't do that Aye. Uh, and I was going to go to Holland to teacher exchange just to make a bit more money because they were getting more money until I discovered that their cost of living was a lot higher yeah. so Aye. you ended up with nothing Aye. so it wasn't just I was trying to get out Aye. Yeah, <laughs> sure yeah of course and all this time the music's kind of growing and growing and it's just the Hogmanay shows they were not the Hogmanay shows the Hootenanny shows yep. they were televised uh, a lot of people wouldn't know them but they were kind oh, of TV shows weren't they big right, TV shows, shows. Uh, they ran for I think it was 26 weeks consecutively aye. on national television not yeah. just in Scotland aye, aye. and you had people like uh, uh, the Dubliners, before they were the Dubliners, mm -hmm. Barney McKenna, Ronnie Drew, Luke Kelly. You had uh, not even Finbar and Fury, Finbar and Fury as the Furies. They were too young then. They Aye. hadn't come on the scene. You had Nadia Katoos, you had Cy Grant, you had oh, all big, big names at the time who were all in this, this rising folk circle. Uh, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? The, the, the folk revival. Yeah. The, the Clancy Brothers and Tommy Makem had been doing it in America on the Hootenanny shows. It right. was big, big, big time there. And they came over here as big stars when we first met them. But then it started in uh, Britain. And what people have got to remember is that there was three television channels. <laughs> and so and for music programmes, there wasn't a lot of music programmes. No. So you um, were in a lot of homes. And they were in black and white. Aye, that's when right. When we first started. Aye. In fact, I was doing a, 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 an interview uh, on Scot Scotland Tonight right. last week. And I was sitting with a red jacket on and a white shirt. When we when colour came in, out of the black and white, we couldn't wear white or red because it strafed on the screen. <laughs> and as we sitting now, we're red and white. <laughs> and, the white. and it took me back. I just had a wee smile to myself. <laughs> and it I, made me feel awfully old. Or well, I, I mean, <laughs> that's the thing now. All your old stuff, because of things like YouTube, it's all there. It's all recorded. Yeah. You can go in. But that's what I'm saying. I can look at it now, thank goodness, uh -huh. and appreciate 
what we did as a Corries at the time I couldn't. Yeah. Because you're too much involved in it. And people say, well, it was a wonderful wall, I was crying when it... And I look now and I say, jeez, no wonder we did well, we're good. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's just looking back on things uh, out of nothing now. Cause yeah. I'm the age I am, and I don't sing now, and to look back on that, I'm out of it, the pressure's off, and I can look at this dispassion and say, Jesus, no wonder people came to shows. You were saying before we started that sometimes when people are introducing you or talking about you, you look around and you say, you're talking about me because you don't recognise yourself. It sounds big-headed. No, no, true. no, no. It it's doesn't true, I don't think it big-headed at all. Somebody's saying, that, although he's reviewed the book and he, he says it's a bit boring, at the same time he says that this man has to be considered as one of the, the significant voices of the 20th century. Me? Yeah. My father's a... a a lorry driver. <laughs> you know, when you get that, although at the same time, because of the reaction of all these audiences, concert audiences, mm -hmm. buying the records here at St Andrew's Societies, everywhere I've been, and that is the reaction you get. So I can accept it, but I don't believe it. <laughs> but and again, I'm the luckiest guy in the world, because anything that came out of that voice was there. I didn't put it there. Yeah. Any likenesses I get in portraits that comes out, mm -hmm. not because... I put it there. It was there. Mm -hmm. So you've got to say you're lucky. You say you're lucky, but I, and but there's a lot of people that just could never even begin to do it. You know, it sort of sounds like it's a natural thing to you, the singing. Well, especially. it is, completely. The, the art of it is to take that luck and use it. Yeah. And make it into, if you could, like it, a job. Yeah. And that's what I think I've done. Yeah. But there's nothing great about it, as far as I can see. I can understand. People say to me, how do you get a likeness in a portrait? I don't know. <laughs> I can go through that, right, has it got a round face or a long face or has he got glasses or has he got a beard or is he not? These are, to me, you see it. Yeah. And to have to try and explain that to yeah. somebody, it's crazy. I think that's Common the problem. Sense. When people say, how do you explain it? Yeah, well, I just yeah. do it. And I think, yeah. they don't want to hear that, do they? They want yeah. to hear, oh, well, I get, you know, inspiration from above or something. You, like. you read the bit in the book you would have done because you had a great review on it of um, Sir Henry Moore. Yeah. Sir Henry Moore doing his sculptures. Some French psychologist writes about him, gives all the reasons why he does it, hands it to Henry. Henry reads it the first page, second page, oh, hands it back. He says, if I know why I want to do it, I won't do it. Uh, There's a lot of truth in that. If I knew all of, of what book was doing, I might have been so embarrassed. If somebody said, oh, sing this song because you make me cry. <laughs> And that's what's happened now, Alistair. Aye. After all these years, I've said it in the book, I've said it on television, and a lot of people think you've gone crazy. All of that emotion mm -hmm. that was all harnessed in, inside me, let's sound big-headed, inside this, this chest, mm -hmm. and you could get that out in a song, yeah. and you could see people crying, and you're thinking, is this me making do that? And because I'm aware of it now, and because maybe Pat's died, and because I'm, I'm getting a, a, into old age, I don't think I'm old, but when you look at 77, I'll be 78 in two, three months. Mm -hmm. so that's that's getting on. And because of that, you tend to get a bit more emotional. Aye. And because of that, I'm, I'm not doing my job properly. If I break down in a song, like I did that, that uh, for the Commonwealth yeah. Games athletes, now, would you not? Yeah. <laughs> two days before the Commonwealth Games open, mm -hmm. I'm asked to go along because they've chosen, now the team was 600 and odd strong, all of these athletes together and they choose their standard bearer. Mm -hmm. There's a ceremony where they all are in the hall, all of their parents, all of their, their, their kids, the whole the place is packed. Athletes are all standing down below the stage. Sir Chris Hoy comes on, presents the standard to the standard bearer and Doogie Donnelly says, and now Ronnie Brown will sing the <laughs> Scott. <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> that's, that's easy so for you to say. I'd rehearsed it in the morning, uh -huh. with the sound check and all this. Yep. But I walk on and I'm standing there and I'm looking down at all these faces, knowing. Now, remind me if I forget what my point is. I'd already helped in the arrangement with the Scottish National Orchestra right. of the, 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 the music to be played in the, 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 the gold medal ceremony. Flag goes up, Flower of Scotland's played, yeah. not sung. And I'm looking down at all these, every one of them wasn't there. Every one of them was on that podium, yeah. wishing you had a go. Yeah. And I stopped doing it now. Aye. And then they, I, I, I thought, I can't stand this. I've yeah. caught up and I've finished the song. But because of that, you've got a reputation. Nobody wants to see an old man standing there crying. Aye. So I'm not doing it. Yeah. I'm and not going to embarrass them or last. me. That's it. Aye. I can't do it. I, 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 
What was the point? What have I got to prove, Alistair? Nothing to prove. <laughs> Nothing to prove. Yeah, really? Anyway. When you think of it. Aye. So, and that, that, that's it. I just can't. I, I, I refuse to do it. I'm not going to embarrass me or anybody else. Yeah. And when you were singing uh, in front of huge audiences before, um, I mean, how did they react? Because there would be people reacting, you know, very similar to that. You of know, course, yeah. No, let's take a stadium. Let's take Hamden, uh-huh. right? All these guys. What, 62,000, 70,000? Ah, it was, right, yeah, yeah. Now, people say, this, oh, this man's singing there. You go and do a sound check in the afternoon, the stadium's empty for three, four echoes, you know, ah, coming sure. down the At first, I worried about it until I realised that when I'm on there and there's 70,000 voices, oh, flow, all of a sudden, nobody's hearing me. <laughs> there's 72,000 drowning me out. That's very Just true. Enjoy it, take the money. There's uh, me on the money again. <laughs> but, I mean, Flower of Scotland... Uh, it is obviously an important song for you and and for the for the Corries as well. How, how did that feel when it kind of took on this life of your own? Because you end up talking to the rugby teams, yeah. to football. I mean, it's really you know. Yeah. Had its own arms and legs. You tell me how it go on. Uh-huh. That's, that's my answer to everybody. They say, "How did it develop?" I don't know. Don't know. Roy didn't know. We never put it out as an anthem. But it was the rugby connection that begun, oh, wasn't it? Yeah, that was yeah, yeah, indeed, yeah. As I've said. When we first started to sing it, it was on television night, it was 1969, in black and white. Mm-hmm. I had the big drum and Roy had a bouzouki. Yeah. It was a new song, and because the bouzouki was the oldest instrument we had at the time, we thought mm-hmm. we'll do an arrangement to try to make it uh, an older feel. Yeah. We did it. And we saw it back, and that's rubbish. <laughs> it just was, there was no spirit in it. Right. What we were doing with it, had nothing to do with the words. Okay. We tried too hard to make it into something. And that's when we started to do it with two guitars. Immediately we started to do it with two guitars. Our audiences, our concert audiences, Corey's concert audiences, yes. took to it immediately. And sometimes in the early, we couldn't get off stage without singing it twice, three times. Wow. And then out of that, we then started to see it. Nobody's going to buy this bloody book, Alison. I'm telling <laughs> them I'm reading the There'll book. There'll be plenty, them. plenty of... <laughs> So out of that, we used to see EastEnders or something, right? Some Cockney pub somewhere. Yeah. And out of the pub, bursting out a couple of drunk Scots singing, Oh, Flower of Scotland. They hadn't learned the second line. Ah, yeah. Out of that came something until 1974, when the British Lions went to the most successful tour they've ever done to South Africa. Billy Steele, who was a Scottish winger, gave Willie John McBride the song because Willie was looking for something to bind them. Yeah. Because that's when the uh, 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 big uh, tr- Brune for Trune. Ah, yeah, I got it. Uh, shout night, then they all come and That's and, right. Uh, the slightest punch and they're in. This was so the, was the that, shout that he came up yeah. with. That once he shouted it, it was basically a free-for-all. That was and right. he just took the guys out. Exactly. <laughs> so that was the atmosphere and it was a tough, tough, tough thing and Willie John McBride wanted something to bind the Scots, the Irish, the Welsh, and, and the, 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 the English. Mm-hmm. And Billy Steele sang the song, and Willie says, that's the one for us. And that's what they did. When they came back to Britain after it, that year they won the award as the team of the year. Yeah. And what did English, Welsh, that's the interesting Irish, thing. Yeah. and Scots sing? One of the most Scottish of Scots songs. <sighs> How was that? There was something in the words, something in the music, something yeah. in the feeling that got to them, and out of that started to develop. But it wasn't until 1990, was that 16 years later, till David Solon and the the Grand Slam squad, who had been singing it under their breath for the past two years, while God Save the Queen was being played, they asked for it to be sung, and that's where it it came in. And that's where it came into the real public. It was 1996 before the SFA adopted it. Yeah. And I was privileged to be asked to go to Austria for a World Cup qualifier, the time they first adopted it, and I sang it. Fantastic. Now, the number of times I've sung it since, most singers I know would give their eye teeth to sing it once in yeah. a stadium. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> <You've> <laughs> got, it's been a cottage industry for me. Well, it's interesting. Every time there's that pride. Yeah. That's, Come on, get in there. There's something about it, and obviously hearing that your audience is were asking for encores with it means there is something about that song which just, yeah. you know, it goes further than, yeah. than most do. And we couldn't understand it. Yeah. Who, who can? It's like you were saying earlier on about, you know, singing, you just do it and then writing a song and then it just, yeah. you get it out yeah. there and yeah. other people react to it. But it's not just Scotland where it's sung. 
yeah. have to explain. It's the world yeah. over. Until you go to Hong Kong St Andrews Society and there it's known as number 37 in their song. <laughs> because they adopted it long before it got this anthem status because they liked the song, number 37. Fantastic. <laughs> the stuff, again, going back to the, 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 uh, with the Pat and the family, um, they took you here, there and everywhere. I mean, you're, you're right at the end of it being in Egypt um, and going out there. Uh, it's... What it was, took you to, to Egypt? What was the reason for going out there in the first place? Just, we used to, to, to go to Penang quite a lot, the, the, the Middle East, mm-hmm. the, 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 out there. And uh, for the sun, like most yeah. people go to right. the dorm or whatever sure. else, because we went there. And for one reason, we went to the, the Nile, we did a Nile cruise and went to Edfu and Kamombo and Aswan and uh, all these places and saw the temples, etc. And we loved it. Loved mm-hmm. it. So you just fell in love with it? Yeah. But I'll, I'll tell you this. One of the reasons we fell in love with it was because on a, a Nile cruise, it's not like your big Mediterranean cruises right. or your Caribbean cruises. It's a wee boat with maybe maximum 120 uh-huh. guests. The first night you're there, what you do is you go down to the dining room and the, the metro, whatever it is, he says, right, one, two, three, counts off ten, that's your table for the week. Okay? Mm-hmm. So you go, and if you're lucky, you hit it off. With the people I... Uh... Our first ever Nile cruise, we hit it off with this table. And the reason being... There was a wee guy called, uh, I won't tell his name because he's dead now, but uh, he came out with this joke. He says, you know, my wife was involved in the, the WRI up in near Elgin, and it was her job every year to organise the girls' tour, the, the, the day out. Mm-hmm. And one year they were going to Dundee, the Sin City of Dundee. <laughs> and they all gathered together at the bus, and as they all trooped on, this Lady Margaret got on and a typical housewife, a farm housewife, tight, perm, and rosy cheeks and big bosom, and she got on, sat in the seat. At the last minute, the minister said, I'm going to come with you ladies as a chaperone in the sin city of Dundee. Right. So he climbs up on the bus, as he's turning to go up the passageway, he stumbles and falls into Margaret, the elbow goes right into her breast, and she goes, oh, she goes, and he's, oh, Utter consternation. She stands up and says, oh, I'm so sorry, Margaret. Says, I hope I haven't hurt you. She says, mind you, he says, if your heart is as soft as your breast, I'll see you in heaven. So Margaret says, well, minister, she says, all I can say to you is, if your cock's as hard as your elbow, I'll see you in Dundee. <laughs> 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 so that was the first five minutes of our first dinner on our first Nile cruise. And it was laugh. For the whole... And we came off the cruise and went for a week in the hotel in Luxor mm-hmm. and we met, etc. And it was a laugh all the way. When we came back home, we explained all this to Lauren, my daughter, yeah. and she came with us the next year and she had a ball and we took to, to Egypt and that's how it started. Uh, and there's some great bits in the book uh, about your time in Egypt. Yeah. Um, so when the Corries were at their kind of peak, very successful, I mean, I take it there would be people that were having a dig at that time because, you know, well, sometimes yeah. when people get that yeah. big, then... It wasn't so much a dig. The folk... When we were the Corrie Folk Tree and Paddy Bell, we were doing very well. Mm-hmm. We started to do uh, uh, folk clubs. These That time, the folk clubs was in, in bars and hotels. Aye. And we worked very, very, very hard at our arrangements, right? Yeah. And when we went to these places... And you're standing there doing your best, having done all this work and get the, 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 the intonation right and the harmonies right and the timing right and all the rest of it. Ding, ding, two pints, please. Boom, boom, buzz, buzz, buzz. <laughs> yeah. And that's what you're singing against. Aye. And we objected. So we then said, right, what we would like is for the bar to be closed when we are on. Oh, you can't, uh, the, the club's dependent mm-hmm. on the, the drink. I said, well, we're not coming. Yeah. One or two bars said yes. We tried it. Ten minutes the bar will close and the Corries will do their hour. <sighs> they went to drink in yeah. that ten minutes. They got other drinks in. So there was no uh, Not waiters going up and down, no tills going while we were on for yeah. the hour. And they appreciated what they did. Immediately we stopped <laughs> back to the bar. And the, the, the barmen were going, they're crazy. So that they went, oh, this is great. And that spread. Yeah. Until eventually we were doing clubs two, three, four nights. We ran out of nights. And I said... To one night, I think it was in Brody Ferry. This is, we, 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 there was a horseshoe uh, uh, entrance up to the, the hotel where the club was on. And I think it was the third night or something. 
as we arrived, there was crowds coming away we thought it was a bomb scare or a fire or something. And we got into the place and said, what's all this? He says, that's the overspill for this, your third, fourth, whatever it was. And I started thinking again, mm-hmm. money man. <laughs> I said, this is crazy. We're doing three, four, five nights to, to what, 200 people a night? Why not, well, I said to the, 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 the folk club uh, organisers, why not take one night, let's say, the Caird Hall? You've got a potential audience here of a thousand this week plus overspill. If they all go in one night, it saves us nights. We can rest a bit, still sing to the same number of people. Ah, but you see that you destroy the atmosphere of the club. I said, well, that's what we're doing. Now, that's where my technique, because I wasn't playing instruments at the time, my technique of jumping down to the audience when somebody comes in late Aye. to create that same intimate atmosphere. And it worked. Yeah. And that's how we went on to do concerts and to concentrate on concerts. Because there was a real connection with your audiences. Yeah, I mean, that's clear. You can see it. and you, you know. But listen, if you're singing to a thousand people and you're not trying to connect, what the hell are you doing yeah. there? But some people can do it and some people, well, I mean, you know, don't do it somewhere. Again, luckiest man in the world. We were the luckiest people in the world. We happened to gel and be able to do it. Aye. Don't tell me. Don't ask me how. Yeah. Okay, ask me how. Because we tried and we were listening and thinking all the time. Did we do that right? And the next time can we improve it? You don't... It just doesn't happen. It might no. just happen first. But, but you once, knew what you wanted to do and give people a good night out. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, uh, I mean, and, and you thought about things like how you would look and what you would play. Yeah. and I mean, there was a lot of thought yeah. about it. Uh, but to get back to your original yeah. question, well, the detractors were certainly did. There was one or two critics who write for papers and things, or oh, they should be doing more of the serious stuff, because mm-hmm. this isn't really folk. OK, I, I, I've told the story, of, uh, I, I discovered the song called The Wild Man of Borneo. Mm-hmm. The Wild Man of Borneo is no folk song, it's certainly not a Scottish folk song, yeah. but, my Christ, it's entertaining. Yeah. And it's a tongue twister, etc. I got that from an old, old guy, Rob Anderson, in the borders in Market Valley when I was there. He did it to his audiences, and they loved it in the bars. Around the it wasn't a folk Mm. It was entertainment. Yeah, but that's the thing. If it works and people like it, you shouldn't put a label no. on it to say, "Oh, well, you can't no. do that." And you get them screaming and laughing, and they all don't. And all of a sudden, oh, I am come to the low country. The lights go down. That's what I mean. what's going on here. And you build them up again with Willie McBride or something else, yeah. and then you stand up, ding, 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 ding. And before they know it, they've been there for fifty-five minutes an hour, and say, "Jesus Christ, it's time for a drink." Aye. So they go, and then you do. So, and they've laughed, they've cried, yeah, they've, yeah. yeah. And they've been entertained and yeah. they want to come back because they've been entertained. They haven't sit in a folk club watching some folk sound coming along with a fag in his ear and the other one on the end of his guitar and dirty jeans and smelling as though he's never washed for a week. <laughs> Jesus, give me <laughs> But that was the image that a lot of folk of wanted. And, uh, of course. So leave them to it. Yeah. And some of our detractors, these columnists, were saying they should do this and do that. Do you know the number of folkies from these places we saw creeping in in disguise? <laughs> they didn't admit that they liked the Corries, but they came in. We can see you creeping in. I'm not naming names, <laughs> No, folks. no. <laughs> but again, because at that time I wasn't playing any instruments, I had time to look around and I saw them. <laughs> Well, Ronnie, we've taken up quite a bit of your time here. I'm delighted. So, and uh, we just want to say thanks so much for, for talking to us. It is a terrific book. Uh, there's a review of my reviews on the website if people want to uh, see what I think about it. But um, well, just thanks very much for doing this. And is there anything else you want to say to us? What I would like to down? say, not too much yourself, but to all these listeners, all you people out there, keep in mind, people like me are nothing without people like you. Well, I'm sorry. What a perfect way to finish. And thank you very much, Ronnie. And that's true, really. People like me are nothing. These are the guys that bought the tickets, they yeah. bought the albums, they listened to the shows. That, without them doing that, I'd be a teacher. Yeah. Fuck's sake. Uh, an unhappy teacher at that. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> well, we'll be back next time with uh, someone who'll be nowhere near as entertaining as Ronnie Brown. Thank you. Mm-hmm.